So this video we want to talk about the regulation of gene expression in prokaryotes. Genes are not always on, genes are not always being copied or transcribed at a constant rate. Um, oftentimes we want to uh, switch genes off, turn genes on, turn genes up, turn genes down, and we want to go through all the mechanisms of how organisms can do that. In this video I'm going to focus on prokaryotic mechanisms, and then in the next video we'll talk more about eukaryotic uh, ways of doing it. So why regulate gene expression in the first place? Well, it's really important in terms of potentially conserving resources. It would be a total waste of time spending all the ATP and nucleotides and amino acids um, transcribing and translating uh, uh, genes and building proteins that were maybe unnecessary um, because you already have plenty of that protein, let's say. So conserving resources. Um, to some extent, you might want to set up gene expression to only occur in a certain environmental context. So it gives organisms much more flexibility in deciding, hey, I'm only going to start making this when I need to in the appropriate situation. So if you link signaling pathways, which we've talked about before, with um, gene expression, and we're going to talk about how those are linked here very shortly, um, then you can sort of have organisms capable of doing different things in different environmental situations. And finally, for multicellular organisms, which are going to be eukaryotes, but the, the broad point is still important here, um, regulating gene expression is important because all of, of a multicellular organism's somatic cells contain the same DNA code. So if you need uh, certain cells to do specific jobs, then you're going to need to um, regulate expression so that certain cells make certain, express certain genes to maybe become a particular type of cell. Um, all of the cells in our body do clearly different jobs, and so how do they accomplish that? Um, I want to talk about the basic mechanics of regulating expression first, and we'll explore more of that question in Chapter 21. So let's talk about, and for prokaryotes, the key players are these. We're going to talk about proteins, um, and, and I'm focusing on transcription factor proteins here. So we're going to talk about two basic types of transcription factors, repressor transcription factors and activator transcription factors. Um, those proteins often interact with different DNA regions, and we're going to talk about two broad DNA regions in prokaryotes, the promoter region, which is also, by the way, where the RNA polymerase protein wants to bind, and something called the operator region. And so just to show you all of those players kind of on one slide labeled, um, I'm going to show you kind of what, what I've created here. Um, we're uh, asking you to imagine um, here a prokaryotic operon, something I talked about in the last video, um, all under a common promoter. I'm finally labeling this yellow region as the operator region. We'll see that that's where the repressor transcription factor binds. Um, activator transcription factors instead tend to bind at the promoter region, which is also where uh, RNA polymerase wants to go. Um, so you can see lots of, of sort of um, indented shapes where certain things fit, and even these guys have their um, allosteric sites. So it looks maybe a little complicated, but we'll try and go kind of one step at a time here. Um, you will also note that if you're following along in Chapter 18.4 that I've kind of color-coded and, and created shapes that are very similar to what they have in the textbook. All right, so um, let's just try and, and talk about these guys kind of very briefly before we then go into the mechanisms of, of how these work in real cases. So um, let's just imagine that maybe neither of the transcription factors are, are sort of um, um, associated with their DNA regions yet. What if just RNA polymerase comes in, binds at the promoter region, and transcribes the gene? Um, what you'd get is an R mRNA transcript and I want you just to imagine that there's some kind of rate that RNA polymerase would transcribe the gene if neither of those types of, of transcription factors are active. So then now let's talk about it with the repressor maybe doing its job. If the repressor binds at the operator region, which is where it tends to bind, um, why does it want to bind at the operator region? Because the operator region is in between the promoter and the gene. And the idea is the repressor wants to repress gene expression. So if it's there at the operator in between the promoter and the genes, then when RNA polymerase binds at the promoter, it's going to like run into the uh, repressor protein and it's going to fall off. And, and importantly, no mRNAs are going to be produced. Uh, gene expression has been repressed. 
Um, as it turns out, activator transcription factors uh, bind at the promoter region. So let's say that this guy comes over and binds at the promoter region. What activators can do is, is somehow sort of recruit RNA polymerases to come more often. And so they have a more uh, kind of an easier time binding to the promoter region. They'll transcribe the gene more often, and you'll get more mRNAs produced than you would without the activator being there. Activators encourage transcription, repressors block transcription. Okay, and so what we want to do now is kind of um, apply those concepts to real world contexts. Um, let's talk about real prokaryotic genes. And um, broadly, what we want to do in this video is we want to talk about different strategies. Um, and I'm kind of breaking them into two broad strategies, and we're going to talk more about the first one, but we'll talk about the second one as well. Um, so there's definitely something that cells want to do, um, and we term it negative gene regulation. And I'm going to talk about that first. And that's really controlling whether the gene is on or off to begin with. Um, negative gene regulation is sort of like negative feedback. If the gene's on and then we suddenly want to turn it off, that's like negative feedback. We're going to call that a repressible system. We want to repress something if maybe it's active and then we work to repress it and turn it off. Sometimes genes are sort of by default on until we repress it. Um, and then there's another type of system called an inducible system. Um, and the, the idea is exactly the opposite. Maybe by default it's off until we want to induce expression by removing the repressor, as it turns out, and turning expression on. So both of these are going to involve just the repressor type transcription factor. And then I'll talk more about positive gene regulation in just a minute. Um, as just a preview of that, positive gene regulation, we're assuming gene expression is already on, perhaps. Um, Positive gene regulation is more a sense of how, how much transcription do we want to take place. We can turn gene transcription up if we say want to really prioritize making a certain um, mRNA or protein, um, or we could also turn expression down. And that's going to involve activator type transcription factors. So let's start with negative gene regulation. And let's also start with kind of the first conversation within that. Let's start with repressible type expression regulation. Um, the word repress, you've probably heard before, if you want to like repress your feelings, you're sort of you know turning them off or you're not showing them. Um, so what we're really talking about with a gene, uh, a repressible type gene system, is we want the expression normally to be on until we want to repress it and turn it off. As it turns out, what we're going to see, kind of the, the idea here, is that oftentimes the end product created by the proteins that we're expressing by copying these genes, um, that end product itself is often what activates the repressor transcription factor to actually turn gene expression off. So let me show you that in terms of pretty pictures. Um, I created these all by myself, by the way. Um, so let's say that in a repressible system, what we're saying is by default, expression is on. Um, let me give you a real life example from your book. Um, these, these operons are extremely famous because they were kind of the first examples showing the regulation of gene expression. In my opinion, a little bit over covered um, on the AP test, but that's why I'm definitely going to talk about them. So um, what's called the tryptophan operon. Um, tryptophan is oftentimes an amino acid that prokaryotes kind of have to make from other amino acids. So they have sort of enzymes in this pathway that through a, a series of steps can convert another amino acid into tryptophan. And since tryptophan is sort of really important in the construction of other proteins, this is something that we usually want to have on in terms of gene expression. We pretty much want to have a, a constant supply of enzyme proteins that can help make tryptophan. So um, by default, expression is on. By default, the repressor is off the operator region. And so RNA polymerase is able to come in. Oh, I forgot. Let me go back. Um, the repressor is off. And how is the repressor off? Because as it turns out, its active shape is currently inactive. So my cheesy way of showing that is I'm going to make my little triangle region disappear. So um, effectively what this is, is it's sort of like the inactive form of the repressor protein, the repressor transcription factor. 
And if its um, active shape is not present, then it can't bind to the operator region. And so RNA polymerase is able to come into the region, bind at the promoter, transcribe the gene, and create mRNAs that are then translated into proteins. Um, by default, we want this um, expression to be on because we need a pretty constant supply of these enzymes to make what is almost always needed. Okay, so when would be a good time to shut expression off? Well, perhaps a great time to turn expression off is when the tryptophan product that these enzymes are trying to make is already present in a fairly large amount. So let's say that there's lots of this tryptophan product around. Um, that would be the best time to turn gene expression off. So how do we accomplish that? Well, um, the tryptophan itself can bind at the allosteric site of these repressor transcription factors. Remember we talked before about what binding at the allosteric site does. It changes the shape of the protein that it binds to. So maybe in this case it changes its shape to, oh my gosh, look, um, now that triangle shape is, is ready to go. Um, now that repressor is active, and so it will go and bind at the operator region successfully now. And now, when RNA polymerase tries to come in, it binds at the promoter, it hits the repressor, it falls off, the genes are no longer transcribed. Okay? Um, what's the idea here? Hey, we really don't need these genes to be transcribed. We don't need more of these enzymes because these enzymes help make tryptophan. And look, we already got plenty of tryptophan. It's almost as if we're telling the RNA polymerase, go transcribe something else that's a priority. We really don't want to waste resources making this. Okay? We've repressed the system. Um, again, my summary, um, a repressible system is one that you perhaps want on by default, often beca oftentimes because the proteins are very helpful in a general context. Um, what can shut them off? Um, end product accumulation is typically what does that. Good, so we've repressed expression. Um, now we're ready to move on to a different type of negative regulation involving repressors. Sometimes systems are just the opposite. Sometimes we don't want them on until we want to turn them off. Sometimes we maybe want to leave expression off until a very particular time when we want to turn expression on. And this is called inducing expression. Um, make sure you use that term as something you've heard of before. Most people have heard of, of pregnant women being induced in order to sort of like turn on their labor at the appropriate time. So um, all we're doing here is we're turning on gene expression. As we're going to see, oftentimes this is uh, for the case where maybe um, bacteria don't need this protein all the time. They only need it in very particular situations. Um, I'll give you an example of what's called the LAC operon. Um, and we're going to see that oftentimes it's the arrival of some kind of chemical um, that makes the, the proteins needed in the first place. And so that arrival of the substrate will activate or induce gene expression. So let's see an example, the LAC operon. Um, so this is an operon encoding a bunch of, of protein enzymes that help break up lactose uh, sugar, the sugar that's in milk. And so this is um, um, well studied in E. coli bacteria, bacteria that are in your digestive system. And you can kind of think of it this way, bacteria can't really choose what you eat. Um, they just kind of have to wait and see what comes through your digestive system and then it kind of makes sense for them then to induce the expression of the enzymes that help break down whatever it is you put down your digestive system. Um, why make a bunch of enzymes that cut up lactose sugar if you never drink milk? Um, when would be the best time to express the genes that help make enzyme proteins that cut up lactose sugar whenever lactose sugar is around? So maybe what happens in an inducible system is that by default, the repressor is active, it's on the operator region, and by default, it's blocking RNA polymerase. We don't need to make these en uh, uh, express these genes right now. We don't need to make enzymes that help um, cut up lactose sugar. So when would be the best time to make those enzymes? When lactose sugar shows up. So let's say that these little yellow hexagons are lactose sugar. Maybe these repressor transcription factors have allosteric sites that fit uh, lactose sugar. So when there's plenty of sugar around, they will probably bind at the allosteric site. 
change the shape of the repressor protein, in this case inactivating it so that it falls off, repression stops, therefore gene expression turns on. Gene expression has been induced. Okay. So here's my attempt to summarize an inducible system. Um, once again, we're trying, uh, maybe expression is off by default, and then when some kind of key environmental signal comes in, it inactivates repression um, to turn expression on for that period of time. What happens if the um, E. coli bacteria does a great job of cutting up all that lactose sugar? Well, then it won't be there to inactivate the repressor, so expression turns back off again. Cool. So um, we just talked about two styles of what I call negative gene regulation, controlling when expression is on or off, and that involved repressors. Now let's talk about the idea that, that not only can E. coli just have expression on, but they can also turn it up to prioritize expression. That's what we call positive gene regulation, and that's going to involve activators. So I'm going to take this red repressor and I'm going to get rid of it, go away so that we can just focus on activators for this conversation. We're going to assume, um, we're talking about the lac operon here, um, maybe the repressor has already been inactivated, lactose is around, we need to cut up lactose sugar. Um, and not only that, but maybe we really want to prioritize it. Um, so maybe just by default with the repressor off, there's some level of transcription, some amount of mRNAs being made. Um, but maybe there are times in the history of a, of a cell's life that it would really want to make a lot of those enzymes. Um, when would be a great time to potentially make lots of lactose hydrolyzing enzymes? Uh, maybe if a cell is desperate for energy, right? The whole purpose of cutting up sugars is to release energy in cellular respiration. So um, maybe there would be a time where not only is a cell have access to lactose, let's say, but it's also sort of starving for energy. Um, what that might do is that might trigger certain signaling pathways um, um, that might release some kind of second messenger molecule. Um, your book talks about what that is for the, for the lac operon. As it turns out, it's a molecule called cyclic AMP. I really don't care about that name. But basically, some kind of signaling pathway gets activated, and maybe the job of that, that signaling pathway is ultimately to bind to the allosteric site of transcription factors, cause them to change shape, in such a way that now they can go bind to their region of DNA code, different transcription factors bind to different operator or promoter regions. As it turns out, activator transcription factors bind to promoter regions to encourage RNA polymerase binding and to um, basically cause the transcription rate to be much higher. Um, let's make lots of mRNAs. Let's really prioritize this particular um, gene's transcription. So our summary so far, without activators, expression would be there, but maybe at a lower rate. With activators, expression would be higher. Um, and, and what is the whole point of this? Cells can maybe prioritize um, not only what genes are on, but, but maybe how often genes are transcribed. Okay? So um, I hope you kind of, from this video, you at least appreciate the big picture of why it's important to regulate the expression of genes. And we talked about kind of two broad mechanisms, um, whether it's on or off with repressor type transcription factors, and whether it's really, really, really expressed a lot or not so much with activator type transcription factors.